Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I just would like to compliment the witness. I think you're doing very well. And as you can see, this is a bit of a tough place. <laughs> so, uh, Judge, uh, one of the issues that I often discuss with nominees, particularly to the Supreme Court, is the issue of abortion. I've asked the three most recent Supreme Court nominees about this issue, and so I'd like to discuss it a bit with you today. In 2017, I asked Justice Gorsuch about this during his confirmation hearing. I asked him to expand on a comment he had made about his belief that precedent is important because it adds stability to the law. In response, Justice Gorsuch reiterated his belief that precedent is important because, and I quote, once a case is settled, that adds to the determinancy of the law, end quote. He also stated that Roe has been reaffirmed many times. I also spoke with Judge Kavanaugh about this issue in 2018. I asked him whether he believes that Roe was settled raw, and if so, whether it was correctly settled. Justice Kavanaugh said that Roe, quote, is settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court, end quote. He said that Roe, quote, has been reaffirmed many times over the past 45 years, and most prominently, most importantly, reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, end quote. And he described Casey as having the value of a precedent on precedent, end quote. I most recently spoke about this issue with Justice Barrett in 2020. I asked her whether she agreed with Justice Scalia's view that Roe was wrongly decided. She committed to, quote, obey all the rules of stare decisis, end quote, if faced with the question of whether to overrule Casey. She said she had, quote, no agenda to try to overrule Casey, end quote. So here's the question. Do you agree with Justice Kavanaugh that Roe v. Wade is settled as a precedent? And will you, like Justice Barrett, commit to obey all the rules of stare decisis in cases related to the issue of abortion, end quote. Thank you, Senator. Um, I do agree with both Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett on this issue. Uh, Roe and Casey are the settled law of the Supreme Court concerning the right to terminate a woman's pregnancy. Um, they have established a framework that the court has reaffirmed. And in order to revisit, as Justice Barrett said, uh, the Supreme Court looks at various factors because stare decisis is a very important principle. Uh, it provides and establishes uh, predictability, stability. Uh, it also serves as, as a restraint in this way on the exercise of judicial authority because the court looks at whether or not uh, precedents are, are relied upon, whether they're workable, um, in addition to whether or not they're wrong, um, and, and other factors as well. So I agree with uh, both of, of those statements that you read. Well, let me add one to that, and then we'll move on. Um, I'm particularly interested in the case of Roe v. Wade. Um, Roe was decided by nearly, nearly 50 years ago, and it's been reaffirmed over a dozen times since then. So my question is this. Does Roe v. Wade have the status of being a case that is a super precedent, and what other Supreme Court cases do you believe have that status? Well, Senator, all Supreme Court cases are precedential, they're binding, and um, they, their principles and their rulings have to be followed. 
Ro and Casey, um, as you say, have been reaffirmed by the court and um, have been relied upon. And reliance is one of the factors that the court considers when it seeks to um, revisit or when it's asked to revisit um, revisit a precedent. And in all cases, those the precedents of the Supreme Court would have to be reviewed uh, pursuant to those factors because stare decisis is very important. Thank you. If you are confirmed, you would be one of only two justices who has also served on a federal district court, the other being jo Justice Sotomayor. In your eight years as a trial judge on the D.C. District Court, you wrote nearly 600 opinions and presided over nine jury trials and three bench trials. As you know from your service on the District Court, it's important for appeals courts and especially the Supreme Court to be clear in their decisions. The clarity is necessary, as you well know, for trial judges to effectively do their job and properly apply legal precedents that are fair and consistent. As a district judge, you were responsible for applying precedent from the Supreme Court and the courts of appeal to your case. And now as a judge in the DC circuit, you're drafting those precedents. Your experience as a trial judge is one of your most significant assets. And I just want to add a personal comment. This is a tough place, and you are handling it very well. And um, I appreciate your directness uh, and think that's important. Here's a question. I have two related questions. How did you make sure that you were properly applying the relevant precedents as a district court um, judge? And if you're confirmed to the Supreme Court, what would you do to make sure your opinions are clear so they could be applied correctly by district courts? Thank you, Senator. As you noted, um, in my time as a district court judge, I had um, the opportunity to apply precedents that were handed down by the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. Uh, the district court is bound by the law as stated by those other uh, tribunals, and I was very uh, focused on making sure that I found the right precedents and applied them faithfully. As I mentioned, uh, with respect to my methodology, part of the process is receiving information from the parties in a case. And the parties write briefs, and uh, in most cases, they identify the precedents that they at least believe are applicable. And then um, the court does its own legal research as well uh, to determine whether all of the relevant cases have been identified. Uh, and then you look to see whether there's anything that directly controls. And if it does, that's your answer. Um, in many cases, the precedents might be a um, little bit different in certain ways, and you are assessing the party's arguments and determining within your proper role um, whether what the appellate courts have said provides the law of decision for the case. But what's important, as you've mentioned, is the clarity by which courts of appeals in the Supreme Court um, needs to operate and so, so that the lower courts can actually follow the precedents. And I'm very conscious of that, as you said, as someone who has um, had to follow precedent. And I would think carefully about that and, and use, um, use my communication skills to ensure that the precedents are clear so that lower courts can follow them. 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to discuss, discuss quickly a letter this committee received in support of your nomination from the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And as you know, this is the world's largest professional association of law enforcement leaders. And the letter states, Judge Jackson has several family members in law enforcement, and we believe this has given her a deep understanding of and an appreciation for the challenges and complexities confronting the policing profession. During her time as a judge, she has displayed her dedication to ensuring that our communities are safe and that the interests of justice are served. And so, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to put this letter in the record, if I may. Without objection. Thank you. I understand that your brother served with the Baltimore Police Department for several years. So here's the question. How, if at all, has having several family members in law enforcement impacted your understanding of the law or your approach to your judicial service? Thank you, Senator. Um, some of my earliest memories, in addition to my father at the kitchen table with his law books, um, were of my uncles. Two of my uncles were career law enforcement, and um, one was a detective, uniform detective. One was a City of Miami Police Department uh, officer, patrol officer, for a long time before he became the chief. And I remember very well, um, we would go to my grandmother's house on Sundays, and um, she would make a big dinner for our family, and my uncles would sometimes come off of their shifts. So I see in my mind their uniforms um, coming in, and they would always, um, they'd be carrying their weapons, and they'd take them off and put them way up high on the china cabinet so the kids couldn't get to them. And I remember feeling very proud of them and the service that they um, provided. And I think it's probably what led my brother, who is 10 years younger than I am, to decide that after he graduated from college, he would want to also be in law enforcement. So I'm very familiar with um, law enforcement, the important service that they provide, um, the perils of being out on the street, protecting and serving, and having a family that cares about you and worries about your safety. Um, and so this is not something that is, that is unfamiliar, and, and I'm very gratified by the support of the group that you mentioned and other law enforcement groups as I go through this process. I joined this committee in January of 1993. And a few months later, we considered the nomination of Ruth Bader Ginsburg to the Supreme Court. Justice Ginsburg's confirmation made her only the second woman to ever serve on the Supreme Court after Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. So we have come a very long way since then, though still not far enough. Women now make up about 35% of active judges on the federal district bench and 37% of active judges on the federal appeals courts. Judge Jackson, if confirmed, you would become the sixth woman to ever serve on the Supreme Court. You would join Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, and Barrett on the bench. This would be the nearest we have ever come to gender equity on the Supreme Court. There would be four women on a court with nine justices. So I have my own thoughts about why gender balance is important on our nation's courts. But I'd really like you to tell us all what are your thoughts on what it means for our country to have women serve in meaningful members, meaning, meaningful numbers on the federal bench, and in particular, what it would mean to have four women serving on the Supreme Court for the first time in history. Thank you, Senator. Um, 
I think it's extremely meaningful. Um, one of the things that having uh, diverse members of the court does is it provides for the opportunity for role models. Um, since I was nominated to this position, I have received so many notes and letters and photos from little girls around the country who tell me that they are so excited for this opportunity and that they have thought about the law in new ways um, because I am a woman, because I am a black woman. All of those things people have said have been really meaningful to them. And, and we want, I think, as a country for everyone to believe that they can do things like sit on the Supreme Court. And so having meaningful numbers of women and um, people of color, I think, matters. I also think that it, it, um, it supports public confidence in the judiciary when you have uh, different people because we have such a diverse society. Well, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, this is often a hard place, and how you go through those hard times, I really think, is um, the most important thing. And it's pretty clear to me that you go through hard times by holding your head up high and doing well. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Senator.